basic disaster risk reduction concepts. What are disasters? What are its causes? How do we address disasters? Can we actually prevent it? Can we actually do anything about disasters? After a disaster, we look at the media and we are shown all the damage and destruction. Later in this course, we will recognize that this type of reporting of destruction is necessary for different humanitarian agencies for fundraising. We hear all the finger pointing on who is to blame for the disasters. We hear all about the different strategies that should have been done to prevent the floods, how buildings should have been made stronger to prevent the collapse, how typhoons are getting stronger because of global warming. We hear about the plea for donations on how you can help the victims of disasters. After our class reviewing power, gender, and inclusion, and community development, think about what are the narratives being formed. Reflect about what mindset and culture is being developed on the poor and the vulnerable, on the rich and the powerful, on ordinary people like you. The deeper you reflect on it, the more you will appreciate how disasters go far beyond the floods or the earthquake, how disasters linger long after we have ducked, covered, and held on to that table, how the response to the disasters can have a more damaging impact on the survivors. So what is a risk? The traditional and dominant definition of risk is the likelihood of harm or loss or disaster in equation form is risk is equal to likelihood and impact and we can place that in a chart when we compute it one axis would be likelihood the other axis would be impact and then we can classify hazards as low priority medium priority or high priority so if it's a it's a hazard that would frequently happen and it may involve a large number of people affected it will be tagged as high priority and a lot of action would be done to address this hazard. This definition is highly focused on hazards. Conventional strategies are focused on reducing the likelihood and impact of the hazard either through disaster preparedness and engineering solutions. That's it. The alternative definition of risk is when the vulnerable are exposed to the hazards. So risk is equal to hazard times exposure times vulnerability, where hazard is the historical and potential physical impact of a disturbance. It can be natural or human-induced, as we have earlier discussed. Exposure is when the elements are affected by the hazard. And vulnerability are human, socioeconomic, and ecological susceptibility. So even if there is a hazard, if we are not exposed to it, we do not have a risk. If the typhoon will bring a lot of wind and rain, if we are far from its path, we are not at risk. If we are exposed to the floods, but we are in the 10th floor of a condominium, we are not at risk of drowning. Even if big houses and shanties are both exposed to floods, the time needed to recover from the disaster is longer for the poor than those who are rich. So the potential impact of the disaster weighs heavily on the most vulnerable. But aside from unpacking what a disaster risk is, this alternative definition provides us more options on how to reduce disaster risks. We can focus on the hazard. We can try to mitigate it by providing engineering solutions. We can place a dike. We can build stronger houses, etc. so that the impact of the hazard will be reduced. We can focus on minimizing the exposure. We can evacuate during a time of a disaster. We can relocate to more less uh, hazard prone areas or we can focus on vulnerability we can reduce the vulnerability we can develop the capacities of people we can improve disaster preparedness 
we can develop the management of natural resources, we can protect the rights of the most vulnerable. We can even focus on the risk. We can transfer it to other institutions, which is what we actually do when we uh, get an insurance. We give the risk to the insurance company so that just in case something happens, they would bear the cost. So now disaster risk reduction is not just limited to having engineering solutions or preparing communities. Now we have a lot, a lot more options when we do disaster risk reduction. A lot of it actually hinges in reducing the vulnerability of the poor. This formula of risk is sometimes used mathematically. In this geographical information system developed by the Manila Observatory, we can see an application of the path, the hazard of the lava flow from Mount Mayon in Albay. We see the exposure map with the darker red barangays being more populated than the light yellow barangays. We see the vulnerability map by factoring in the poverty, poverty incidents in each barangay. We bring this all together and we generate a consolidated risk map, a powerful tool for the provincial government to prioritize allocation of their resources to high-risk communities. But disaster risk analysis is far from being simple and being straightforward. Different coefficients can be factored in. Maybe adding the square of capacities to the numerator will further improve the equation. Maybe the Human Development Index is a better measure of vulnerability and capacity. Maybe we should downscale the maps even further. The debate can be very technical. We risk losing sight of the essential of disaster risk reduction and again risk marginalizing the poor and vulnerable from the conversations of the authorities, the experts, and the resource holders. By unpacking disaster risk, we surface the role of vulnerability. We have already started the first step of connecting people to disasters and transforming the mindset that they can do something about risks and the disasters they cause. We will recognize that resilience goes beyond people surviving and coping with the destruction. These maps are critical tools in understanding disaster risk. But again, be mindful of who has access to this information. What action do these knowledge lead to? Who do they mobilize? Now let's look into some common disaster management frameworks. The most common framework being used looks into the different phases of disaster management. The starting point is the disaster. Immediately after the crisis is the disaster response phase. Various activities such as life-saving action and provision of relief goods are conducted. Humanitarian action on saving lives and reducing suffering are the primary concerns. The length of time of this phase is dependent if it is a rapid onset or a slow onset disaster. For rapid onset disasters, such as floods, typhoons, and earthquakes, usually this takes around three to six months. During Super Typhoon Yolanda, the disaster response phase lasted one year. After the first year anniversary, there was a policy to stop the provision of food and food aid, not because there was no more hunger in the extremely affected population, but simply because it was time to move from disaster response to the next phase of disaster rehabilitation. Build back better is the mantra from this phase onward. How do we rebuild their lives, livelihoods, and facilities? Several activities on recovery and rehabilitation already happen even before the disaster response phase ends, so the distinction is not necessarily clear-cut. Actions on restoring livelihoods, rebuilding houses, and community facilities are just some of the activities involved. A critical component is to ident identify and prioritize what needs to be rebuilt. The next phase is disaster mitigation. Often, disaster risk reduction is associated with the mitigation phase. We try to mitigate the impact of the disaster by reducing the risk. From reforestation projects, to designing comprehensive land use plans, to conducting research on risks, and building awareness and ed education. Critical component here is the identification of risk. If we do not look deep into the risks 
our actions may be misguided. But by focusing on mitigation, we will be able to not only reduce casualties and damages, sometimes we are actually able to prevent disasters from happening. Kahit may malakas na lindol, pero kung nasunod natin ng maayos yung building standards sa paggawa ng ating mga uh, bahay, maaring mayanig lang tayo, pero hindi tayo madi-disaster. The last phase is disaster preparedness. In terms of sequence, disaster preparedness does not necessarily come after disaster mitigation since preparedness can be conducted even during the disaster response phase. In terms of timing, disaster preparedness simply comes before the next disaster. Activities include early warning systems, contingency plans, trainings on life-saving skills, emergency drills, etc. The main problem with this disaster management cycle is that it is a cycle. The cycle starts with the disaster and ends back with the, with the disaster. While a build back better approach may lead to a spiral such that the impact is lesser for each new disaster, such is not necessarily the case. Worst of all, it does not bring hope to vulnerable people since there is no real transformation that happens. A better alternative framework is the disaster crunch model, wherein we recognize that disasters is a result from a hazard or a trigger and an unsafe condition or a vulnerable community. When these two hits, a disaster happens. But it also recognizes that unsafe conditions are brought about by dynamic pressures because of policies and practices and processes and institutions and actors. If there are no proper representation, if policies are not pro-poor or people-centered and do not address poverty and inequality, and dynamic pressures have underlying root causes, and this may be political, natural, economic, sociocultural, this is where our values, beliefs, ideologies, inequality, doctrines, prejudices, environment, market rules, conflict happen. Now we rec recognize that there is a progression of vulnerability from the underlying root causes to dynamic pressures to unsafe conditions. And that's when disaster happens. So for our pressure release model, during a disaster, what do we do? Yes, we do emergency response. For the trigger, we do hazard reduction or mitigation, provide early warning systems and contingency plans, we do climate change mitigation, and we provide engineering solutions. For the unsafe conditions, we conduct local capacity building for preparedness and disaster mitigation. For dynamic pressure, we do structural reforms and we promote pro-poor policies and practices. This we would require advocacy, development, and genuine participatory governance to address the underlying root causes. We have to look for accountable governance, political, social, economic, and environmental justice and equity, people empowerment, and peace development. Here, we would require people-centered development, education, and formation. This is the pressure release model. From these basic DRR concepts and our concept of people-centered development, we now start developing the elements of community-based disaster risk reduction. CBDRR recognizes that vulnerabilities are the primary determinant of disasters. CBDRR contributes to addressing roots of people's vulnerabilities and transforming structures that generate inequity and underdevelopment. It strengthens existing capacities of people. It puts a premium on community organizing and organizations. It considers people's participation in decision-making as essential. And it mobilizes vulnerable people into different partnerships. Be conscious of the differences of similar strategies. 
they overlap in some areas and complement each other, but they involve different thought processes in analyzing the problem, developing objectives and goals. Disaster risk reduction overlaps with disaster response in disaster preparedness strategies. Climate change adaptation overlaps with disaster response when communities are affected by the changing climate extremes. It is often associated with DRR because of the emphasis on vulnerability reduction as an adaptation to long-term irreversible changes brought about by global warming. Climate change mitigation is often confused with disaster mitigation, but both are very different strategies. Disaster mitigation reduces the impact of disasters through DRR, while climate change mitigation reduces the impact of climate change by reducing the greenhouse gases and promoting clean energy sources. However, both overlap in the objective to promote more long-term adaptive capacity of vulnerable communities. So far, any questions?